Hi, it's Rick Hansen here with Amazing Greats, and thanks for joining us today. Today, we have a story of a musician, a world-renowned musician, who you will remember from being the lead singer of Santana, and he was also the founder of contemporary Christian music. His name is Leon Patillo, and we get to talk to him today on Amazing Greats. Well, lifelong musician and songwriter, uh, lead singer on time with Santana, you did albums with him, you toured with him, uh, mm -hmm. you hung out with the, the greatest of the great back in the day, Earth, Wind & Fire, the Pointer <laughs> Sisters, Smokey Robinson. I mean, it was yeah. all part of that whirly, swirly world. And mm -hmm. then there was Life Pivot, and maybe the biggest story of them all, uh, after Santana. So we're going to get yeah. into all of that here in just a couple of seconds. We're talking to Leon Patillo, uh, uh -huh. Tillo, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, Originally, I was I was calling it wrong, and so it's still in my head wrong. But yeah, I hear that all the time, though. That's the, it, that's why all the kids we deal with here in town, I just told them, just call me Mr. Leon. <laughs> just, <laughs> and they, they they came up with the name, so I, I you know one of them just came to me one day, uh, 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 Mr. Leon. That's what he said. <laughs> I said that's a good idea. There's well, you might, yeah, you might be finding me saying that here a little later right, on. Right, that's so. okay. Yeah, Patillo <laughs> is kind of hard to it's hard to pronunciate sometimes. So, yeah, <laughs> well, it's very cool that you're here with us today on Amazing Greats, the podcast, and uh, truly yeah. a great musician, entertainer, uh, and maybe most importantly, a, a, an incredible follower of Jesus himself. And and we're mm -hmm. going to talk about all of that. But let's first dip into that whirly swirly magical world of rock and roll slash funk and, and soul <laughs> yeah back yeah, to the yeah. 70s and you were the lead singer from santana yeah gosh yeah. can you bring us back to that period of time and what was it like uh where were yeah. you up there you know it's really um remarkable how it happened because i was really trying to break into the music industry and i took my little band from san francisco down to LA and we thought, okay, we'll just try to get in that Hollywood scene and see if we can get ourselves uh, going. And as soon as I do that, make that big move, then I get a phone call from Carlos Santana's managers asking me if I would come up to uh, back to San Francisco and sing on an album. And I was like, wow, how did he even uh, find out about me or how is he really wanting me to sing on this album for sure? And come to find he's been kind of as they've been taken off with the group in the late 60s, they were also kind of overseeing things that were going on in San Francisco. Of course, Bill Graham was our manager, and uh, Bill was into everything. So uh, I think when Greg left uh, the original lead vocalist, they were looking for someone, and Carlos evidently ran into one of his kunga players, uh, Marcus. And Marcus said, yeah, man, I got a tape I want you to hear. And that tape just so happened to have my voice on it because I was trying to help Marcus do something with his music. And uh, so he, he played the tape for Carlos. And Carlos said, is that Leon? He said, yeah, Leon. Wow. Man, I haven't heard his voice in a long time. He said, I, I think I'm going to get in touch with him to see if he can come do an album with me. So they called me. I came up from L.A. I sang on all the songs, you know, Black Magic Woman, Oh, You Come Ba, I Gotta Change Your Evil Ways, all of those. And Carlos just announced to me at the recording session that he wanted me to be the next lead vocalist for the group. <laughs> I said, wait, wow. I was wow. moving a band down to L.A. And there, you know, we're waiting to break into the, the big time. And he said, well, uh, yeah, he said, but I, I really need your services up here. He said, I love your voice. And I love you to be the next lead vocalist. My big deal was going back to L.A. and telling my band. And once I told them, they said, oh, man, if we had that opportunity, we'd all take it. So they just said, we'll just continue on and then uh, you go up and, and do what you have to do. And so that was my uh, my entrance into uh, his life and into the band. Wow, that is so cool, <laughs> man. What a story. And Bill Graham, of course, was legendary in music at the time. So you yeah. shared him as an agent? You both were. Yeah, he was really our uh, manager. And he uh, actually was the one that did Fillmore East and Fillmore West. He did Woodstock, of course. That was the big one. And uh, it was just tremendous. That man's mind. I, and the way that he, when he loves on you, he loves on you all the way. And Santana was the group that he just had closest to his heart. So any concert that he would have uh, in the Bay Area, he would have the Santana group open up for the band. If it was Hendrix or Marvin Gaye, whoever was, was there, was doing their thing. Uh, we, we were the ones that opened up. So 
everybody's uh, all the other people got a chance to see the Santana band. All the other fans of other bands got a chance to see Santana. So when that first album came out with that lion on it, that thing sold like three million like right away. So <laughs> yeah, it was it was Bill really really loved us and just used us in every kind of setting he possibly could, and that really helped the group to become popular. So if you could pick out one song that is memorable to you and maybe memorable to our audience that uh, yeah. Santana did and you did on stage yeah. and you did on... I've got a black magic woman. I've got a black magic woman. Okay, so that was the one. I really, I don't know why that one stuck in my head. But then after I made a conversion, I switched it. So I got a born again woman. <laughs> <laughs> so I switched it up, you know, keeping the devil off of me. And so anyway, that's kind of how I switched. And so that became fun. Um, even when I did some seminars for a while there with a friend of mine, uh, Peter Lowe, they had a seminar called Get Motivated. And I was trying to figure out what should I do at these you know, real estate seminars. There's 20,000 people. And uh, they will always announce me from Santana, but I had some of my lyrics at, at that point. So, uh, anyway, but that, that's when I started to make the changes in the lyrics. And uh, and seemed like everybody from even a uh, secular community enjoyed the the song. So anyway, yeah. Nice. So that's that was my favorite. Nice. Yeah. Well, Leon. So you, if you um, were, did you have a Christian background as as a young boy? Did you come, grow up in a Christian home? Yeah, mom and dad uh, were both uh, church going people. Uh, mom was Baptist. Daddy was Methodist. So anytime. You know, we went to church. We'd go to one or the other. We'd kind of jump around from weekend to weekend. And then when they didn't feel like going to church, they would send me down to the local Catholic church. So I got a chance to have an overview of uh, those three denominations. And it really gave me kind of what I would call different sides of Jesus. You know, it's kind of like that, you know, because everyone is kind of pushing, you know, their agenda, you know, in the church. <laughs> you know, so everybody kind of comes from a different way that they bring it. And so it really kind of gave me a, a jump start. And then my first movie that they allowed me to go to was the Ten Commandments. Oh my <laughs> so, gosh! Wow. Yeah. So I was being bombarded in my youth, you know, uh, concerning spirituality. So uh, I really thank God for that. That was your roots. That was your foundation. That's you know where you got your initial instruction. But where along yes. the way did you really have a relationship a, with Jesus? Your, well, believe it or not. When I joined the group, that's when it happened. Um, this may sound a little strange, but Carlos was Buddhist, right? So when I first uh, kind of interviewed for him or whatever, we went down to his uh, basement uh, in his house. He had a studio down there, and I saw incense burning. I said, wow. I said, I wonder why he's got the incense. Smell good. And uh, he said, well, I believe that's like prayer is going up to God. I said, man, I had never heard anybody in rock and roll talk about God in any form, you know, because that runs the girls away. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> and, so I, and it was really funny to hear him talk. But then I started dating a girl in San Francisco, and her brother uh, was also a Christian. And so I started hanging around with her, and next thing I know, man, he just kind of talked me into going to a Bible study one night. And, man, that's where I heard the claim to Christ, and it just it sparked everything from my childhood everything I had learned, all the different stories and scriptures. And it was just really familiar to me. And I think maybe in the back of my head, I was thinking, well, it may not be too bad to make a decision because Carlos is doing it and it's not good in his career. His career is going like this, you know? So I, I think that kind of scratched on my spiritual spiritual brain a little bit. And and when, I, when brother asked me if I'd like to invite Christ into my life, it wasn't foreign to me. I just really felt like, man, yeah, this would be a good thing. Only thing is, I said, I just don't know how my lifestyle uh, <laughs> is. That going to change? You know, that was one of my questions. And he said, Yeah, we'll just we'll work that out. Just you just keep reading the Bible and keep praying, and God will help some of those areas uh, just switch along the lines of what you desire. So I said, Okay, and uh, you know, that's exactly what happened. It really had to happen over time because I think the very first week, I think I was still smoking or something a little bit and uh, still doing some drugs. And, and it took maybe months before that started to kind of not be as important. And uh, so it is a, it was a change in my life, but it wasn't like zapple, that kind of change. <laughs> it, took, right. it was a gradual you know, change over time. And it's still, you know, like we all are, we, 
we still have our areas that we struggle with, but uh, at least we have someone to run to and uh, that understands that has mercy and, and like that. So, yeah, and I really appreciate that about our Savior. So then that must have matured in such a way that there was rather a shocking uh, decision made at that point to yeah. uh, leave that crazy, fun, high-energy yeah. <laughs> business and completely pivot. How yeah, did that, that was... decision, was that, a, was that something you heard from God? What? What happened? There? Well, you know, I think as we were doing these concerts, now I'm Christian and playing in Santana. And, you know, your sensitivity is almost like antennas go up and, and you start being more sensitive to stuff. And I found myself, in a sense, hearing like question marks in people's hearts when they would come into the arena or come into whatever football field we were playing on. It was amazing just to hear the emptiness, even though they were yelling, yeah, Santana, come on. Yeah. But inside I could feel that there was just something wasn't quite all settled. And maybe some of their outward the stuff they were doing was kind of covering over some of the emptiness they were having. So I said, now how can I address this? I said, maybe the best way would be to get out of the group and to just form a, a whole nother situation musically that would address, you know, that emptiness. And so I went to Bill Graham uh, just as a, just to see. And so I knocked on the door and, he, you know, he was always, I never heard him speak much English. It was all four letter words, <laughs> everything he said, because he had to keep <laughs> the ball rolling, man. So he hardly had time for you, and, you know, and if he did, he'd, he'd be yelling at you most of the time. But he, he was he knew how to get business done. Anyway, so I knocked on the door and he's yelling at me, who's that? Who's that? I said, it's Leon. Oh, come on in, come on in, sit down over here. And he's smoking a cigar or whatever, you know. He said, what do you want? I said, well, and I knew I was going to get a barrage of language when I told him that I was going, I needed to make a change in my, my musical career. And so when I approached him, he he just went off on me. He just said, Leon, I don't. I don't understand what you're doing. He said, you've been pretty religious around here, though. We we knew something was getting ready to change, but we just didn't know what. And uh, so he said, so you want to you want to get out of the group, huh? And then he started offering me money, you know, like double my salary, double, triple my salary, that kind of way. And I was like, oh, man. I said, well, look, I said, let me go home and pray about this for a minute. <laughs> and so I had to take a minute. I had to take a beat because I didn't expect that. But I really, when I got home and prayed, I really knew that, you know, this was a whole new area of life that was opening up. And I knew I needed to pursue that. I didn't know it was going to be called contemporary Christian music. Uh, all I knew is that this was just a chance for me to kind of uh, deal with the emptiness that I kept hearing in people's hearts. Uh, that was, that's why I got out. And uh, it really was interesting, but not having any forerunner, uh, maybe Andre Crouch, uh, and maybe in those days, Mahalia Jackson, I don't know if you know her or yeah. knew of her. But yeah. anyway, that's all I knew you yeah. know, from our school. Of, of so, our somebody music. along the way had said that, um, phrased it this way, and I, I loved it, so I want to want I want to say it too. Is yeah. You went from Santana to Hosanna. That's <laughs> right. That's exactly what happened. Yeah, my wife came up with that phrase. <laughs> I said, Did that's she? good for publicity. So we've been using that all over the country. <laughs> Very nice. Um, so... In the in the pivot to contemporary Christian music, yeah. which really wasn't a thing when no. you when you made the conversion, you were mm -hmm. one of the original founders of what has yeah. been become this yeah. amazing music genre that yeah. has got its own stars, its own concert tours. It's yes. got radio stations devoted to it. It's got millions mm -hmm. of fans, and mm -hmm. you were right at the beginning. How does that? Yeah. Feel? You know, it was scary because, um, you know, I always have kind of the joy of the Lord in me type of way. And uh, so my music was always kind of a little bit more up-tempo. And uh, so I didn't know how that was going to go over in the church. Uh, so we started actually doing halls, uh, you know, where it was acceptable. You could go and do a hall, Radio City Music Hall or someplace. Uh, I think we did the music hall in uh, Houston. And we did a lot of different places around the around the country. And then the churches finally said, okay, we're gonna let drums in, we're gonna let in electric guitars, you know, like that. And so then we started doing, you know, a lot of churches. So it became between the churches and the halls. But I think I liked the halls better because um people that were not 
you know, maybe from a faith-based situation, they people would bring their friends and they would come, and they would hear this music and they would have the same kind of uh, thing happen with them that happened to me. They, they yeah. just make a change right that night. So uh, it ended up really being like a little mini Billy Graham uh, <laughs> crusade, <laughs> you know, all the places we would play. Cause I'd make sure at the end, I'd always throw the hook out in case somebody wanted to, you know, come into the kingdom. From Bill Graham to Billy Graham. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that something? Yeah. Isn't that something? I mean, it that's is. really the truth. That's so honest because I, uh, Dr. Graham asked me asked me to start joining him uh, on his trips, and he would like send me out six, maybe six, eight months ahead of the time he's going to come to the arena, and uh, I'd get all the kids going, or sometimes he'd send me over to to women's seminars or whatever like that. So uh, anyway, yeah, but it was and it be, just became a thing. He and I going around the country together so it was that was fun yeah. little, a little <laughs> side note too and I, and just kind of to support and and uh what you're saying is that i was i was raised a catholic all right so ah. at a, in, in catholic church uh, it was uh -huh. a lot of uh hymns yes a lot of uh you know robed gospel singers mm -hmm. uh, but that didn't click with me the, the time ah. it clicked with me was when i walked into this church it was being held in a in a high school gymnasium, okay. lots of people there, mm -hmm. but on stage was like you say, electric guitars and drums and <laughs> songs that sounded like top forty songs, right? Uh, right. And it really because I'm a kind of a top forty guy, so it really uh -huh. uh, struck with me. So that it, was oh, a, wow. it was a big part of my my change as well. So wow, that's good, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, did you? uh have along the way during your career and in your personal life have mm -hmm. a place or two that uh this was a you've already described one that's clearly a, a a directive of god and that is the switch from uh from santana to hosanna but yeah. um where else along the way can you cite where you got direction and you responded to that direction okay uh since we're on a personal tip yeah uh, 88, I really, I think I was doing too many concerts, Rick. I was doing like 160 a year and, uh, I was solo artist. So I was taking, you know, keyboards and uh, all that sort of thing. Uh, not necessarily a sound system, but we had at least 24 anvil cases just for me. Wow. <laughs> I mean, I got this big piano that we would hook up. that looked like a grand piano. I had synthesizers with a kind of an elevated stage. Uh, it was really, really kind of cute back in those days. And um, I think I just was doing too many concerts, not really watching my family life that close. And I kind of got off base a bit. And um, so I went to Jack Hayford's team and I started talking to him about what was happening. And uh, Jack just straight up said, man, you need to get out of ministry for a while. I said, really? <laughs> I said, get out of ministry? He said, yeah, you need to get out. And I said, well, when do you think it'd be okay for me to get back in? Because I'm thinking maybe a month. <laughs> you know, he said, well, until you your whole heart and all of that starts to turn around like it was back in the day. I said, wow. Do you know it took me two years? I didn't do a concert for two years. And Jack Hayford just kind of kept me under his uh, tutelage there. And so we actually um, did a seminar, I think, for men like at the end of the two years and i wrote this song called breathe on me and it was just like i was just asking god man i just really oh if i could just have you breathe on me you know get rid of all the stuff that's just been you know keep the distance between me and yourself and um at that seminar that's where jack said you're ready you're ready i said wow so 1990 uh i had gotten a scripture about foreigners rebuilding your walls and so my very first concert was in U uh, Ukraine. <laughs> so oh, I was really? in Kiev. Yeah. I went to Ukraine and then it's like a 30 day thing under the Billy Graham uh, organization. And, and it was actually uh, Ukraine and Russia. That's what we were there to do for 30 days. And so it was really a good time to be in a whole nother country around a whole nother type of people and talking about, Oh, these people. I mean, I don't know what's happening now, but in those days, in the 90s, those people were so sweet. 
I had never met in 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 Kiev. I never met anybody like those people. You, me, and my engineer would be standing on the corner, you know, kind of walking down Christianic Street, and they are long streets, man. I don't know if you ever been to Russia, but when one block is like four blocks anywhere else, and so we'd walk, 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 and get down to the corner, and by the time we uh, get ready to go across the street, there's a whole bunch of people following us because they saw us walking down this long street. And they would come up to us. Ah, hi, Dr. Uh, how are you? I said, I'm doing good. And they would hand me like a pencil or something. They said, here, this is for you. You take back to America. Take back to America for us. I was like, what kind of people are these? They just come up and just give you stuff like this. If they had a ruble or anything like that, they would just give it to you and say, hey, take this back to America. That was a big deal for them. And wow. they love to talk about anything you want to talk about. So course at the top of my list was the lord jesus christ so that's all i wanted you know i hope it was spread around you know so this has got to tear you up to see what's going on over there right now oh, i yeah. just i just i just heard so much for those people in fact they they taught me how to do i wrote a song called i lay in zion for a foundation a stone i don't know if you remember that one but anyway i wrote that coming out of israel uh Pastor Chuck Smith uh, baptized me over there in the Jordan River. And out comes this song, you know, a real Israeli type of flavored song. And they taught me how to do it uh, in their language. And so from time to time, I'll go to certain parts of the world and I'll sing that. And inevitably, there's somebody from either Russia or Ukraine that is uh, in those concerts. And they and when I get through, they say, you sing that good. You said the words just perfect. I said, well, thank you very much. So that was uh, that's probably a long story short, but this that's really uh, another big change that happened for me. It's real personal, and it's something I think that got me back into uh, wanting to do ministry, but for a whole different reason. Now, I had a whole different love for people when I met those Ukrainians. So uh, that spit me off into a, a whole other feeling of love, you know, for, for that yeah. neighbor. So. Yeah. yeah. Whoa. That's a great change. I love that. <laughs> I love that story. So yeah. tell me, uh, you're not only a musician, uh, but you're kind yeah. of a, a disciple. Uh, you, you have, uh, taken, uh, under your wing, uh, kids, mm -hmm. uh, for one yeah. thing, I, I saw where you have a thing called sing against bullying and, uh, you yes. have a heart for people, uh, young people who have been adopted and troubled mm -hmm. kids. Uh, yes. tell me what's going on in your world with that. Well, actually, it started with mom and dad. We always had foster kids in the home. And so I just admired, you know, their heart for kids. And I said, when I get out of Santana, this is what I want to do, too. I've got to find some way to love on kids. And so uh, I ran into a lady named Miriam Golden, who is out of Sacramento. She has an organization called Koinonia Foster Homes. And um, so I hooked up with her and I said, is there any way I can help? And she said, yeah, she said, at your concerts, if you could just mention us and mention that we need homes for kids. She said, that would be awesome. So I would have her table right next to my album table when I go to sign autographs. And she'd probably have as many people at, at her table as I had in mine. <laughs> and so over the years, we've got thousands of kids now in, in homes. And uh, so that's kind of how it, it got started. Then my wife and I, we moved to Vegas 2011. And um, Miriam had uh, retired by that time. And so we we're just trying to figure, okay, what should we do? And so the next thing we know, we started hearing about after school programs that were, uh, they were just cutting them out, nothing for the kids to do. So I said, well, maybe we can have some sort of contest where we can have kids sing and, you know, compete like that. So we took from, I think they were like eight year olds to 16 year olds. This happened right before the pandemic. We had, we've had a whole big change since that. But it's just been a, a beautiful thing to see these kids get together and just try to do their best with their vocals, with dancing. Some of them play instruments like that, so that's kind of cute, too. And so we started this uh, foundation called SING, uh, Save and Inspire the Next Generation, what it stands for. And um, we found, though, Rick, that the kids, after a period of time weren't that interested <clears throat> maybe so much in singing as what was going on in their school and they were being bullied in the school and a lot of them were talking to me about suicide 
And so everything switched up uh, at that point. And then the pandemic hit and I figured, okay, well, at least we'll be able to go online and deal with the kids that way. They won't be bullied because they're not going to school. Huh. The suicide went up 22% during the pandemic. I was like, how is that possible? It's they're being bullied online. I was like, oh, this is horrible. So I figured um, this is something maybe we didn't, but we have just crafted a movie. Uh, I'm working on a movie right now as we speak, and I'm basing it, some of it kind of around a 14-year-old girl that really was being bullied. She's a little heavy set and had uh, kind of stuttered a little bit, so they just mess with her all the time. And right to the point that she really wanted to commit suicide, she actually did attempt it. And so the movie kind of takes us up to that point. And she actually um, goes into an out-of-body kind of experience, after-death kind of experience. And uh, it's dark. It's, it's, it's dreary in this place that she goes when she's almost dead. And so we, we I think that the week that this uh, movie comes out, suicide is going to plummet. That's what I believe. I think every kid that watches this movie is going to say, well, I don't want to go to that place, <laughs> wherever that is. So we, that part would really be graphic. And uh, it, it has a good good ending. But um, anyway, and then I've also got kind of me and Renee's story kind of woven into it because we met on a cruise ship. And uh, here I am. I come on this cruise with Miriam Golden to talk about Point And uh, And Renee is there with her family. And she's a professional poker player. That's the field she comes out of. So, really? and then we just hit it off romantically. It's just like, and I kept thinking, well, how is a preacher and a poker player go have romance? That's, like, <laughs> that's going to be weird. That's what kind of life is that going to be? And a lot of my friends, uh, pastor friends, told me they said, "Man, you can't show up with a poker player on your arm. You're going to ruin your career." <laughs> so, <laughs> so, the story kind of um, ebbs and flows. With, with us, with our story, kind of a little bit about Renee grew up in the Philippines and, you know, me and kind of, you know, us meeting on the cruise ship and it goes all the way through. But it's it's, it's got a great ending as well. So anyway, so that's what the movie is yeah. based on. Yeah. I just got to say, Renee is is a charmer. I, I've only yeah. had an opportunity to chat with her and be back and forth trying to line this up. And she's yeah. just yeah. wonderful. She's just a yeah, wonderful person. Lady. Good heart, man. Good heart. She's brought me down to, down to earth. My head's Nowhere near as big as it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> I could get through a door now. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's excellent. And so let's now we're talking a little bit about. Oh, first of all, I wanted to get the name. Do you know the name of the movie? We're uh, calling it All In for now, uh, and slash uh, from Santana to Hosanna. And then, but we're still thinking maybe it could be uh, line could be for creature. You know. Feature and folk player. I don't know. We we haven't decided the subline yet. Uh, we have to get with the producers and kind of figure all that out. But just this, everything about the movie is all in. You know, I get saved, so I'm going all in. Renee comes away from the poker field and throws her hat into, uh, you know, ministry. She's all in. Uh, the girl that commits suicide. She's all in. So there's so many little instances where you know I kind of do that at the end of the movie too with. Uh, salvation, trying to get people to um, take Christ into their life that you like to be all in with Christ. So we're kind of going along those lines. So that's the thinking for now. Any idea when that might be available to view? Probably well, the end of 25. I think it will it will hit theaters uh, at fall of 25. Perfect. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's great. What a great project that is. My goodness. Yeah. And a big yeah, one for sure. That's a heavy one. So we're raising funds now, of course. Everything yeah. is, we gotta, gotta have money to do these things. So <laughs> it's just, it's five stages. We've done the uh, script writing and screenwriting that part. And uh, I had a screenwriter in. So now we're in the pre-production, which is right before we start shooting. And so um, we're just, we're off about 40K at this point. If we get 40K, we'll be ready to shoot. So cool. that's all we need. Yeah. So what I told my producer, I said, I know I have 40 friends. <laughs> so each one given, you know, 1K, we're done. So uh, and I think the last couple of years, we've been pulled in something like maybe 12, something like that already. So I'm going to go and put this out my, for the fans so that they can, uh, even small donations will help. So just as long as we can hit that number, we'll be, we'll be done and ready for the 
to, to maybe, get to camp. Maybe, out. maybe it's worth a phone call to Carlos, see what he's got going. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we've been hitting up all our big buds, and they've yeah. been, they they have actually been given. Yeah, it's really funny. They they all feel it. They know suicide is one of the things that you, I, I, the president, all the way down. We don't. Nobody has an answer, you know. But I think this movie is going to, you know, raise up some talks where we can get these kids into some place where they can talk with somebody about their issues. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So let's talk, let's, let's talk about, let's talk about family. So uh, you have four children. Yeah, we have, we have six. Six. (laughs) Yeah. We got five boys and one girl. Oh my. They they all have been trying to do something um, artistic, you know, that sort of way. Um, But, I think only a couple of them have really caught it where they could use it to, to live on. Yeah. And uh, that's Gabriel and Marcel. They are the ones that have uh, caught on. Gabe has actually uh, been in Toby Mac since probably 22 years now when Toby first started because he was with Toby um, when, when he was in the other group. But then DC uh, talk. Left, yeah. Yeah. He left there. And uh, so decided Toby just wanted him to come with him. So yeah, he's been with him ever since the beginning. Yeah. And uh, so he's just now, uh, he just November last year, he decided to do something else. He found another, uh, something that's been warm in his heart and he wants to go that direction. So he's testing that out now. So he told Toby, he said, well, I got to step away for a minute and let me see what else God wants to do with my life. And he's got a little illness too. He's got a pancreas that's just causing him a lot of trouble. So we're, we're praying him, trying to pray him through that. Um, but the doctors they keep saying it doesn't look good, but he's just I just see him him, him believing and trusting God and I think he's gonna get, get over this thing. So Excellent. just pray for Gabe. Yes, keep yeah. keep him on in your prayers. Yeah. Absolutely. Did some research on you, did some yeah. digging. Uh-oh. And uh you played your first piano when you were five years old. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in grammar school. Is that school. true? Yeah. At grammar school, the teacher brought in a she brought in a little thing, a little like a cardboard thing. And it had a uh, piano piece painted on it. And so she set it down in front of me and I just started doing everything she was doing on the piano. And oh, next thing I know, uh, she calls mom, she's Lee's class and calls my mama. So you got to start with music. And so I get home and, and uh, my mom said, your teacher called today. I said, Oh, well, that's not good. <laughs> and then she explained this whole thing about music. And so she bought this piano, put it up against our little bay window there at the house. And, and I just started taking lessons. And the next thing I know, here here come the girls. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, you know how it is. You know, you attract all kind of people when you're playing that music. So uh, it just became a thing. I'd go to parties and instead of playing music at the parties, they'd like to hear me play the piano. So next thing I know, everybody's around the piano and we're singing the popular songs of that day. You know, so wow, yeah, just interesting life, brother. I just uh, I see God all over it. I know he he already predestined me to to transition from Santana to Hosanna. I knew that was the case just looking back at my childhood. But music yeah. is really one of the great ones to let some of the walls down people have and and let in something that uh, you wouldn't ordinarily let in. So, do you I'm reconnect with you. any of the old um, the old mm-hmm. rock and roller folks from back? Yeah, in the, um, yeah. it's uh, Philip Bailey. We met on a tour. We took them to Europe the first time. Uh, they went to Europe. It was a Santana and Earth, Wind, and Fire tour, and it was really cute, man. I, to get all that music for us, you know, not much money in those days, and so. Uh, but we, me, and Philip were the ones that became friends on that trip, and um, so I still keep in touch with him. He was just in town uh, last week. Uh, he was here for the Super Bowl, so uh, we we got together and, and hung out for a little bit, and you know, we Very talked nice. about the Lord and talked about you know changes his life whatever's going on like he's, that. A, he's so, a christian fellow yeah as well. he's a christian man mm-hmm. yeah, yeah yeah he got saved uh actually on that trip we took to europe um or he t- i took him as many of them that want to come to my room for bible study every night i have bible study in my room <laughs> so <laughs> some of the santana guys would come and, and a lot of earth wind and fire guys would come and so we just end up having bible studies uh, during that whole six weeks so after the six weeks um three of the guys uh larry Done. Andrew Wolfolk, who just passed away last year, and Philip, uh, you know, got closer with the Lord on that trip. So 
Wow. We came back and got everybody, man. We said, okay, <laughs> let's go get our other friends. So Donna Summer and Smokey Robinson, all these people, we just said, let's just get them. So we held a big concert in town, and that's where they all came to the concert. And we called wow. it Jesus at the Roxy. And uh, yeah. they, they all showed up. <laughs> that was actually Philip's idea. And so anyway, yeah. And then we next thing we did was have Bible studies on Thursday night uh, at wow. my house and sometimes at Philip's house and Smokey's house, you know, like that. So music, you got a movie coming out. You're um, helping out kids all over the, yeah. the, the place. And, and you're still on tour. I looked at your tour yes. schedule. You still got... Uh, I think I saw 23 uh, yeah. events lined up. Uh, one yeah. of a couple of them are actually in Washington State, so you're up in yeah. you know, our neck of the woods. Yeah, um, I'll have to hit you up when we come through. There you go. That'd be great. <laughs> That'd be absolutely fantastic. So I I gotta really uh, thank you so much for taking oh. some time with us uh, to thank share you, your story. You know, I think yes. it's going to be powerful and impactive on our audience. Good. And you Good. are truly an amazing and inspirational guy. So I, I really Thank appreciate you, your taking the time. Thank you, brother. Okay. What an amazing guy and an amazing musician as well. And an amazing follower of Jesus. Thank you for joining us on Amazing Greats as we do this every other week on Wednesdays. We provide you with one of the great stories of a Christian believer here and their career stories as well here on Amazing Greats. So God bless. See you next time.